Amen, amen, amen. Woo! Can I have an amen on the Facebook chat? Can I have an amen in the house? <laughs> Whoa. Well, it is my honor and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Hurst today. Dr. Hurst is a renowned teacher. He's, writing, he's written so many uh, manuals and teaching, and he has just poured his life out into the body of Christ. And we are fortunate enough to have him here in the house, uh, here in your house. But we're also fortunate enough to have him overseeing Crossroads, and uh, he He's, he's Pastor Jason's Papa in the Lord. So um, you can check him out. Since you're on Facebook now, you can actually check out his um, Facebook account at William J. Hurst, H-U-R-S-T. And we will post some of his website um, on the page because apparently he has uh, a handful. So um, if you would, let's give him a crossroads welcome, everybody, shall we? Well, first of all, I love that last song. Yeah, Jesus, you change everything. Because before you started singing, I had no idea what you guys were doing this morning. Um, but before you started to sing it, I heard God say something for this church. So please listen carefully. Um, first of all, uh, let me get the greetings over. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. It seems like it's forever. And we were trying to figure out how long it's been. But when COVID hit, everything shut down. And uh, we moved to Florida, so it's a little more <clears throat> difficult to get here. But um, as we were singing, and I looked around, and, you know, COVID has cut down our physical attendance, but the Lord said that's to get our eyes on the spiritual attendance. And see, the folks on Facebook live, there's probably more than you would have normally here. But it says we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. They're here. And by the way, witnesses don't have their back to what they're witnessing. Oh, I wish we could hear that. They are facing what they're witnessing. And so we really need to catch that. But here's the word I heard. Crossroads is being born again. You have been in the womb in a confined space. And when the time of birthing comes, all the pressure in the baby is on the head. Of course, none of you guys are having any mental battles whatsoever. Everything is going just fine. You can cast the lying spirit out of me later. Uh, but do you hear what I'm saying? There is a conflict. A restriction, I remember years ago, 1972, at Pinecrest, Sister Jewel Courtney, an old prophetess of the Lord, she wasn't old then, but she's gone on now, so she must be old, um, came up to me and prophesied over me a restriction that enlarges. That's what Crossroads is going through. A restriction that enlarges. Let me just read something because how many know that we leave the book of Revelation for the last days? Anybody ever figure out when they're at? Sometimes. Some days. <laughs> some days. Some days I think I'm there, some days I say no, no, no. But in Revelation 14, you see, we leave the principles out. There are vital principles in the book of Revelation for today, whether it is the last days or not. And because we have all, all of us have come through some type of religious upbringing, we have assigned this stuff to the last days and never figured out the timeline. I want to say that God is bringing forth some things that we're getting ready to walk in 
now. Okay? And if we're walking in the principles now, well, I wish you could hear this. Amen. If we're walking in the principles now, then what's going to happen? We will walk through all the end time without a problem. Because you see, we will have matured into We will have matured into all it takes to walk in it. We hear about the principle of overcoming. And again, we leave that for the whatever those days are. No, no. Overcoming is something I learn to do now. So here in Revelation 14, and this is just an additive, not going to cost you any more. But I feel it has to do with what God's calling this little church to. And listen, your impact is not dependent on your size. I have a little great-grandchild. Actually, I have nine great-grandchildren. And I'm not as old as I look. No, uh, I have nine great-grandchildren. And one of them is a little dwarf. Four-year-old, just the cutest little thing, and I'm not biased at all. <laughs> but he has impact wherever he goes. Doesn't depend on his size. And so let's put the size thing to his side. When you're through this birth canal, God will change your size. Okay? So here in Revelation 14, and I looked and behold, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name in their forehead, or his father's nature in their mind. Okay? And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and the voice of a great thunder and a voice of harpers harping on their harps. Now, harpers are not complainers. Just want to make that clear. My grandmother used to say, stop harping. She wasn't talking about playing those nice little instruments. This is not talking about what we say. It's talking about what music comes from within. The harps are not external. Oh, I won't get into that. But that's fun to study. All right. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000. By the way, that is not a literal number. That is a group of people, or a group, a company of people, whom God raises up and does a special work in. Okay? has nothing to do with the number 144, except that 12 times 12 is divine government times divine government is fullness of government. Okay? Now, it says these 144,000 were redeemed from among men. They're a redeemed company of people. And God is bringing forth today a company of people who are first fruits. What does first fruit tell you? It's prophetic of a full harvest. What God is going to gather in here are a company of first fruits, which is prophetic of full harvest. But the first fruits come in first. And some would say, oh, Dr. Bill, you're talking about being elitist. No, I'm not. I'm just reading scripture. And lifting your vision. So I want to go and, and just tease that word up a bit, Tiffany and Jason. Tease it up. Begin to study into it. Because God has some prophetic things in there for you. 
that will be unique to this place. God does unique work in every place. There are some things that are basic, that are absolute, that are foundational. But God, just as I had five children and a foster child, and every one of them were different. You know, you come to a place, you want, how can this one be different? They're all different. Trust me. And, and I had to relate to each one according to their uniqueness. God is going to relate to crossroads according to the uniqueness he develops in it. So I want to talk now, just go totally different, uh, take a totally different sidestep. I'll leave that there. You can pick it apart or pick it through and strain it and everything else you do with the word sometimes. But I want to talk about something that I feel is vital to where the church of God is today. Those who are pressing into all that God wants for them and want God's fullness for their life. But see, we have been focusing on healing, not on wholeness. There were ten lepers that came to Jesus, right? Those ten lepers, he said, go your way, show yourself to the priest, and you'll be healed. One came back. He was made whole. The others were healed. Which would you rather have? Wholeness means that if they had had limbs eaten off by the leprosy, they were restored. If eyesight was gone, it was restored. If they had trouble walking because their toes had been eaten off, They were restored. That's wholeness. God, God wants us to shoot for wholeness. Okay? So, I'm going to speak this morning about falling among thieves. We're going to define thieves because they aren't who you think they are. In Luke 10, 30 to 35, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him and departing, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked. And passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Underline that word compassion. It's not love. It's more than that. Okay? And he went to him and bound up his wounds and pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took two pence, that's two days' wages, two pence, and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come, I will repay thee. Now, the man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. There's a number of reasons why that could be. Okay? And most people have use the first one. It's possible that he was walking away from a God-centered life. Because you see, we've only used this for sinners. Can I tell you, it has nothing to do with sinners. He may have just been going to Jericho on business, and he may have been a ministry on a ministry trip. Oh, ministry doesn't fall among thieves. You want to hear some stories? (laughs) I've been in ministry 50 years, and I think I've been stolen from a number of times. Now, I want to catch this. We're looking at this as if he was an innocent man who had done nothing wrong but was just going about his daily life in God. So we're setting aside all the reasons we've been taught. And we're saying, this happens to the regular guy. 
Okay. Because our emphasis is the spiritual journey and a journey to freedom. Didn't we sing about freedom this morning? She didn't ask me. She asked me. She did ask me what, what I was going to speak on when I told her. She said, I'm just going to worship God. Because <laughs> how do you sing a song about thieves, you know? <laughs> now, it's essential to understand his perspective concerning his experience. This is where we find out where we have been stolen from. Or if we've been stolen from. This is called reading the parable emotionally to grasp the fullness of the trauma it produced in him. How often do we read the scriptures emotionally? We've been taught to read them like a textbook. And when you read them like a textbook, you treat it like a textbook. We call them stories. They aren't stories. Because when I, you know, with our kids, we would read them a bedtime story and we would have a fairy tale sometimes and we would, you know, and they got the idea when we begin to call the Bible stories that they weren't true. It, well, we didn't do it on purpose. But that's what we did. And God corrected me some years ago. He said, these are historical accounts. They are parables. And I'm treating this as a parable. A parable has layers of meaning. That means if Chuck Swindoll preaches on this parable and it doesn't sound like Dr. Bill, Chuck Swindoll is not wrong. That's a layer of meaning. Okay? And God is getting us ready to flow in our lane. I looked around the church and I saw these one-way signs, you know. I thought, goodness sakes, these are traffic lines. God has a, a lane for crossroads to flow in. He has boundaries, not because there's anything wrong with you, but because next in your lane, there's somebody else with a different emphasis. <laughs> That doesn't make what your emphasis is wrong. And yours doesn't make his or hers wrong. It's that God is developing a unique relationship with each individual. And a unique relationship with each corporate expression. And before we're done, because God has put the pressure. The church is on reset. We're finding out what's important and what isn't important. And the church is on reset, the whole nine yards, of, or ten yards, whichever. Okay, the context of this parable is the land of Israel, which can represent the realm of the saved. Why? Because in those days, Israel was the only one that carried salvation. But Jesus was here, but he hadn't died yet. So everyone that was keeping the law as best they knew how was considered saved. So we're not talking about him falling out in the Gentile world. We're talking about this is a Christian, if I could put it that way, a Christian context. And each of the... Oh, come on in. The door just came open. Each of the lookers-on, the priests and the Levites, were religious or saved men. And in this case, they were both ministers. Different levels of ministry, but both ministers. It's possible that the thieves were also, oh my, Dr. Bill, saved thieves? <laughs> well, you know, Paul wrote to one church and he said, let him that stole steal no more. What does that mean? When we think, we think you know, it got somebody's wallet. Not necessarily. Remember, it's a spiritual book to a spiritual people. My, but it's quiet out there. All right. I call them here in, in the uh, 
in the slides, Jews but rogues. In Second Peter 2 and 3, and through covetous have they, or shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you? Whose judgment now is a long time lingering, or lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. He's writing to the church. He's not writing to sinners. Revelation 18, 13, and the cinnamon, and this is talking about what they're crying out that Babylon did, and Babylon has fallen, but it comes down and it says one of the things they traded in was the souls of men. Now, this is a rhetorical question. Do not answer out loud. Have you ever been in a church and felt like the ministry was trying to manipulate you? Are they merchandising in the souls of men? Now, that one could be teased out a bit, haven't it? In Colossians 2.18, let no man beguile you or defraud you of your reward in voluntary humility, worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly, ritualistic, legalistic, liturgical worship. It can steal from you. Now, what's it do? The presence. It steals the presence from you. And listen, if, if anything gets stolen, if the presence gets stolen from you, that's a difficult place to be. You can go through a lot if you have the presence. In Matthew 6, 19 and 20, lay not up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where, what? Thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. The barriers are up, but they're ignored by thieves. Have you ever felt somebody is invading your space? They're breaking through your barriers. And usually that's not good. You feel violated. In Ephesians 4, 28, let him that stole steal. I mean, let him that stole steal no more, but rather, yeah, okay. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands the thing that is, which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. I call this a word to Christian thieves. When I do not labor for what I receive, is it a form of stealing? Now, I'm not talking about benevolence. I'm not talking against welfare unless they're able to work and don't. And I'm not talking about Congress. Oh, well, we won't go there. Uh, You hear what I'm saying? God is cleaning up his church. And we have kept all these things on the natural realm, but there's spiritual realities. The devil never counterfeits anything that isn't real. He hasn't an original bone or thought in his mind. He's not capable of it. So he has to mimic and corrupt what God has given. Okay, he fell among thieves. Thieves take what is not theirs and use it for their own gain. Every Christian at salvation is given gifts, every one of them. If you receive the Spirit, it says he gives to every man gifts several as he will. Not the one I want, you know, we go with our kids into our grandkids, great grandkids into a toy shop. I want, I want, I want. I've gone into churches and hear Christians say, I want, I want, I want. Talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And God has given them ones, but they despise the ones they have. 
and want the ones sometimes that are more showy. But you've been given gifts. Everyone who came to Jesus, no matter where they are, no matter what church they came to Jesus in, they were given gifts. This man may have been told they're not valid because the group he was saved in didn't believe in them. They were stolen from him. There are a multitude of other ways that we can be stolen from spiritually, emotionally, mentally, decision-making, our identity. They all have spiritual parallels and impact as well as leave wounds in the soul and spirit of a man or woman. My emphasis today is not so much what is stolen, but healing the wounded. They stripped him of his raiment. We're given the righteousness of Jesus as clothing when we come to him. Possibly the thief, thieves gave him a book of rules and stole from him the revelation of grace. I'm saved by grace and kept by grace. Not saved by law and kept, or saved by grace and kept by law. And some of us, the reason we're here today is we came up in churches where we were saved by grace and kept by law. And something in here said, something's wrong. Because I can't do this law stuff. I'm breaking the rules every day. And I've read the rule book time and time again. Or I've read the Bible like a rule book. Not like a relationship book. Okay? Saved by grace and kept by law is a what? Look at the word, the last word up there on the slide. A syndrome. I know I do plays on words, but that's a good one. <laughs> they wounded him and departed. Wounds come from relationships. Someone who does you don't love cannot wound you very deeply. But if they love you and you love them, you can be pierced all the way through. Wounds come from being neglected, rejected, and feeling abandoned. Now, would, if you fell among thieves and were left by the roadside half dead, would you feel like you were neglected, rejected, and abandoned? These are internal things, aren't they? They're not external. They're not visible wounds. Wounds in your spirit can cause you to misinterpret some word or action that comes into your life. Your flesh reacting can cause misunderstanding. Of course, none of you have flesh, but Canadians like me do. So, <clears throat> and they left him half dead. The wounding of abandonment and rejection because you do not meet their expectations. Oh God, deliver us from putting expectations on people. Because when we do, and they don't meet them, we actually wound them. We may wound ourselves because we put expectations on them they couldn't meet, and our discernment gets swapper jawed. Okay? Now, styles of possible help is what I call this one. The priest came down that way, and when he saw him, he avoided him as best he could. He was too busy doing God's work to attend to the individual. Yeah, that is an ouch, isn't it? Functioning in the gifts, but can't apply them. And any resultant instruction to everyday experiences of life. If the gifts of the Spirit cannot be applied to daily life, we need to mature some more. He gave them for interaction. Yes, we can use them in ministry on the streets. But what about here? This is where God wants, he wants to heal us so we can impart wholeness wherever we go. 
focused only on that which pertains to what is typed and shadowed in the holy place of the tabernacle, the gifts, the ministries, deep word, high dimensions of praise and worship. Because you see, the priest could go into the holy place. The Levite couldn't. So it would type whatever is possible in the holy place. And we haven't got, obviously, time to teach on tabernacle. A Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Curious, but he doesn't have time to get his hands dirty. How many know that in the hospital, when you're working with the wounded, you get your hands dirty? Sometimes you get a lot more dirty than just your hands, but I worked in hospitals for six years. And I was a disorderly orderly. Consequently, I got my hands dirty, my uniform's dirty, you know. But this Levite didn't have time to get his hands dirty. A wrong understanding. Now hear me, please. Because I think God is getting ready to break a lot of our religious concepts to set us free to heal, see people healed. The religious concept uh, in 1 Timothy 2 and 4, a soldier must not entangle himself with the affairs of this life. So I don't help you. Because that's the affairs of this life. A religious understanding of be separate and touch not the unclean thing. And avoid the very appearance of evil. And we have used those scriptures to hide from helping people. Mm -hmm. From getting our hands dirty. My wife has this saying when, when she's involved in some things and we come back from them, she says, I go to the labor and I wash. You know, if you're helping someone out of the mud, guess what? You're going to get muddy. But guess what else? It'll wash. We need to remember that the labor was running water. So it constantly got clean. I've got to come to the washing of water by the word and wash the externals. Helped by a social or religious leper. I think God's raising up a whole company of those guys. A certain Samaritan. By the way, the Samaritans were a mixture of Jews who the Assyrians had sent people to marry into the Jewish, that Jewish community. So they were a religious mixture. They didn't have all their doctrine together. They didn't worship the right way. They didn't go to the right places. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. I think the word compassion is vital for these days. Okay? The Samaritan represents the religious mixture which was hated by the Christian, I mean the Jew. And they despised and rejected the group that didn't agree and do things the way we did. That, that's a pretty experiential translation of that. But Isaiah 53 and 3 says, Jesus was despised and rejected of man. So the Samaritan had more of Jesus and the nature of the Father than the priest who served at the temple or the Levite who served in the outer court. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Every time Jesus was moved with compassion, he released an answer in an action toward the objects of his compassion. Now, I've used a scripture that we would not normally use for this because we always think of healing and deliverance and all those things. Okay? But I know Tiffany will like this one. <laughs> Mark 6 and 34. 
And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them because they were sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to what? We never think of teaching as an act of compassion. In Jude 1 and 22, and some having compassion, making a difference. Compassion is love that makes a difference. God is wanting to raise up a group of lovers here. But not just lovers, a group who has compassion and hears from God what the answer is, regardless of what religion says. This is the definition that God gave me some years ago when he said there's a difference between compassion and love. He said compassion is love with the answer and a willingness to administrate it. Every time Jesus was moved with compassion, it released an answer from heaven. It was almost like he couldn't help himself. Oh God, bring us to a place where there's so much of the compassion of Jesus in us. We can't help but let it flow out in an answer. Whether it's healing, deliverance, prophetic word, teaching, but the lives are changed when we're moved with compassion. So compassion is true pastoral ministry. Ezekiel 34, 3 and 4. This one needs to be studied because God's about to bring forth some true pastors in the earth. They are not the head CEO of the local congregation. Most of those pastors are so busy doing the CEO, they don't have time to do what God called them to do. And I'm just going to mention these because this is what the Samaritan exhibited. Ezekiel 34, 3 and 4. And this is what God said to Ezekiel, the pastors should do, or the shepherds. They should feed the flock. They should strengthen the diseased. And there's a whole bunch of questions around this, but we haven't got time for them this morning. Neither have you healed that which was sick. What's that mean? You should have been healing the sick. We stop with the healing of the body. But if someone has been through sickness, there's trauma in the soul and possibly in the spirit as well. That takes discernment to know how sick they are. Why do we go to a doctor? We go to a doctor when we're sick and don't know what it is. What does he do? He diagnoses the problem. Now with the physicians on earth, they're still practicing. And they're practicing on you. But Jesus, the great physician, does not need to know and explore and find out and put you through a whole bunch of tests to find out what's wrong. Now listen, people. That's what God wants his ministry to be able to do. We don't have to guess. But we do have to expand our sight and ask God to give us spiritual eyes that will see into the soul and the spirit of a man. Okay? Neither of you bound up that which was broken. Neither of you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. Let me say about the, the, uh, the last two something for a moment. I was reading this one day, studying it, and the Lord said, who drove them away? They were there, and they got driven away. Who drove them away? And then he said, the pastors. And I said, what? He said, how many places have you watched and people come to the Lord and then the harshness drives them away? You give, them a, give the people a rule book so you don't have to relate. 
That's part of driving them away. And then if you not sought that which was lost, and the Lord dropped this into my spirit, without a vision, what happened? Oh, do you mean that these who are lost have lost their vision? I was standing in the church I started in Kingston, Ontario, and I was ministering, and the Lord said, some people here are lost. My mind immediately went to getting them saved. He said, no, 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 without a vision. They're here, they love God, they worship, but they have no vision for their own lives. What God wants for them and the destiny he has for them. And when they get the vision, they're no longer lost. See, we, we were um, dealing with someone the other day and the child was, you know, a problem. I run into a few of those along the way because I had a few. No, I've, but the Lord said, remember, the spirit returns to God who gave him. Therefore, if they're here and alive, I send them and they have a destiny. I need to ask God for the destiny, vision, for the people he's given into my care. And when I see it, every time they come to me for counsel or whatever, or when I'm praying, I pray into their destiny, not into their past. Not into their present, where they're messing up. I pray into their destiny. Because you see, if I pray according to his will, which is their destiny, I know that he hears me, and I know I have the petition wherewith I ask. Oh my. Did the Samaritan move in true pastoral ministry without a valid ministry title? That's a question of the half, isn't it? <laughs> He went to him. He did not make the wounded come to him. He met him where he was. Second of all, he poured in oil and wine. The oil keeps the wound soft and from scabbing as well as keeps the infection or air out. And the oil is a type of the spirit. How do I pour the spirit into your wound? I have to ask the Father, don't I? Because only he knows the shape of the wound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And only he knows how much oil is required. It may depend on the size of the wound. The wine disinfects the wound, cleansing it. Oh no, that's communion. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. We have this narrow, narrow idea that God wants to expand so we can become a place of healing. Mm -hmm. Not just the physical. I want to see more physical healing. Yeah. And that will get people, you know, that, that will draw people. But the goal is, when I see them heal physically, it sets the stage so they'll trust me to minister to the soul and spirit. Okay? He bound up the wounds, covering the wounds so the oil and wine can do their work. In Ezekiel 34, 16, it's a valid function of ministering, sharing, and healing. He set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. He inconvenienced himself to see the traumatized or the wounded healed. This is what I believe God wants us. He knew a safe place to take him so he would be in a protected place to heal. That's what God wants this place to be. A protected place where people can come and heal. Where the people who are the doctors and nurses in the house if they don't have what's needed, they know who to call. Do you know there are not that many safe places in the earth today? And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence. That's two days worth. Two days wages. 
gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will pay the bill. Now that's putting yourself out there. Okay? But he left him in a place that he trusted. Lord, raise up trusted places. He was willing to pay whatever price it took to see the man made whole. Lord, bring that attitude into me. I have it on certain things, but in other places I'm not quite sure. Do you follow me? I'm just being honest, folks. God is looking for people who say, who who don't have it. All. The Samaritan did not have it all together. He definitely didn't have it together according to the religion of the day. But he was despised and rejected. But it didn't stop him from ministering wholeness. Some people are waiting till they get it all together. You may be waiting a long time. <coughs> because I think there are times when God will not let you get it together until you're willing to minister and flow with what you have. That's coming from a few years of experience. God, I want an answer. I want an answer. And he brings me someone who needs that answer I want to me. And I don't have it. But it's God's thumb in my back to press me into getting the answer. Or becoming the answer. It doesn't say he reimbursed the one stolen from for what he lost. But he did bring him to a place where he was healed and set free to function once again. Sometimes we want to give them back everything they lost. That's God's prerogative. Now, I'm not saying don't help them at all. I'm just saying you've got to hear from God. Okay? Because some people, when they get whole, part of God's healing for them, it's actually a place of redirection. And if I try and restore to them what they had, they'll never be redirected. That's why I've got to hear from God. That's why I've got to hear from God. Here's the challenge. There are numbers... A number of groups in the church today. There are those who live in Jerusalem and the center of God's will and purpose. There are those who travel in ministry like the priests and the Levite, but have no interest in seeing the wounded freed from their wounds. In Luke 4 and 18, which is a quote from Isaiah, he came to set at liberty those that were what? What happened to this guy who fell among thieves? He was wounded and bruised. Your bruises can inhibit you from growth. Okay? Now, there are those who have fallen among thieves. They're stripped, stolen from, wounded, and left for dead. In the land of no what? What's that we sang this morning? See, I knew if I left it to her to choose, the Spirit of God would get the right things. Because I, I, I honestly knew no songs that would fit with this. So, and I gave her no help. <laughs> God is raising up a company of Samaritans who may not have it all together themselves, but will go out of their way to see the wounded made whole and set free to function once again. Isn't that awesome? We don't have to have it together. We have to be willing to let the Spirit move us with compassion where we are in our experience with God and let God take care of the rest.
Oh God, we're tired of religion. We're tired of the religious mess that's been made. But God, this incident, this parable gives great hope. Doesn't it? I don't have to have it together. I don't even have to know everything. I don't have to worship at the right place. Remember the Samaritan woman? Jesus, should we worship in Jerusalem or in this mountain? Because they won't let us at Jerusalem. We worship in this mountain. Jesus said, it's not a place. It's a condition of heart. And I know people have used that to not go to church. But there are other things that would balance that out had we time to teach. But folks, stop waiting until you got it all together. I'm not sure God would let that happen. <laughs> because it's in the mood, I being in the way, Eliezer said, the Lord led me. I was moving in what I thought was the right direction and the Lord led me from there. I go back to when cars didn't have power steering. Anybody ever driven some of those old cars? You're sitting still and you're trying to turn the wheel and it takes every bit of muscle power you got. But if you got it moving, it steered easier. Are you hearing me? God, bring us to a place where we're moving and you can steer us. Now, in order to function in their giftings, many need healing. They're gifted. But remember, the gifts are not an indication of maturity. They're the tools of God to bring you to maturity. What happens if you don't use the toolbox? The work doesn't get done. I mean, every time we come here, there's something new and different. Somebody used the toolbox. And it looks great. You know, the atmosphere is fun here. Okay? God wants us to mature while we're moving, while we're functioning, while we're flowing. We can function in God, but while we're functioning, God wants to cleanse us. Now, here's something God gave me years ago, and it's become um, a real part of my life. When God flows through you, let him do a work to you. You know there are people that move in gifts and ministries, but they're not changed. Their character's not changed. And when they get they, they, they may even keep a list of how many got saved in their meetings. But when they get to heaven, they'll hear the question that God asked Bob Jones. Did you learn to love? It's not how much we accomplish. It's whether we hear from him and press toward what he asks us to do. It's not a negative to be the one who fell among thieves. Hello? Hope that sets some people free. <laughs> to stay that way when healing is available produces problems within without. Internal healing brings total freedom. Now, I just want to briefly talk about something because, and then come back to the healing portion. God has made provision for when we are stolen from. There is restoration. He put it in type and shadow in the Old Testament. And the least that happens is they pay double. In other words, God is going to give you what one person, one I think it was Jack Cole Jr. said, God's going to give you double for your trouble. Okay? But, 
I like Proverbs 6 and 30. It says, Men do not despise a thief, a thief if he steals to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. Listen, the one who's stolen from you has been caught. His ability to keep you was destroyed at Calvary. He's been caught. So whatever you've been through that has stolen things from you, there's coming a day when sevenfold will be restored to you. Oh, my, my, my. Now, if I was in, a, in, a, in some churches, they'd be shouting and running in the pews right now. Because we need the hope in the midst of the struggle to carry us through that God has promised that no matter what has been stolen from us on spirit level, soul level, and even on the natural level, God is going to restore sevenfold. Oh, I wish we could hear that, not just in our head. God delivers from head knowledge. And get it down into our spirit so that we become men and women who when people get around us, we emit hope. Not even in what we say, just we carry a presence of hope and confidence in God. Let me go back, because I want to look at this whole area of healing. I think God wants to show you what's been stolen from you. Some of us, it's been normal. We go from, you know, get kicked out of this place, or we, we leave because we're not being fed anymore. We hear from God to move, whatever the reason but we leave part of us behind because we've been stolen from. God is a restorer. God is a restorer. God wants to take you beyond healing to wholeness. And this morning as we close, I'd really like to pray for you that there would be released a power of healing on a level we've not known it before. That it would bypass our mind. Unless the mind needs healing. But it would get into our spirit. And infuse us with hope. Now it may take some time. For that healing to grow out into fullness again. I don't know. But our cry needs to make me whole again. Make me whole again. Some of you were stolen from in the womb. And you don't know what wholeness looks like. God, give me a vision of wholeness. Father, this morning, I ask that the angels of healing would come in this house and go across the airwaves to those listening this morning. And in that, there would be a real sense of you doing a work. Father, that we would be challenged in our spirit and realize what God is up to. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Angels of healing and angels of wholeness. Come, we pray. Help us. Minister to us. Especially minister to our spirits where some of these wounds are healed. We ask in your precious name. Amen.